This is Ben May, and I want to thank you for joining us again as we continue to seek the old paths. We have been studying from the book of Genesis, and if you haven't already done so, I would encourage you to take your Bible and also your workbook that uh, many of you have called in or written and requested, and I hope that you found it to be useful. I tell you, I've enjoyed it, and I hope that you have as well. And we're going to continue our study again in the book of Genesis as we seek the old paths. Now, we have often quoted Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, where God through the prophet Isaiah says, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where the good way is, and walk in it. And that's what we're trying to call people to do, to get back to the Bible. And by the way, uh, maybe you have not yet ordered your uh, study guide. It's free. All you've got to do is use the information that will appear on your screen from time to time, and we'll get one of those to you. Brother Billy Carter has been so faithful in promoting this program and getting the materials and supplies and such out to those who are studying with us. And if, you, if this is your first time, uh, that, that's fine. You, you can pick right up with us as we continue through the Bible. Now, let's just give a very brief summary of what we have talked about, not all the way through Genesis, but at least a little bit of the backdrop, if you will. We're talking about the patriarchs. The patriarch, the word means father rule. At this time, God would talk directly to the heads of the families, the, the first one being Abraham, and then it would be his son Isaac, and then his son Jacob, and Jacob's sons. And that will take us through the book of Genesis. Now, as we think about Abraham, Abraham was called out of Ur the Chaldees. And he is told to, uh, to go to where God is going to, to tell him, but he doesn't know where he's going. It took great faith, didn't it? And so he moves to eventually to the land of Canaan. He leaves Ur of the Chaldees. He travels up the Mesopotamia River. He goes up to Haran, and then now he eventually makes his way down to Canaan. Now, in Canaan, God says to Abram, I'm going to give you and your descendants this land, the land that you are now in. In the course of time, Abraham found it necessary to move for a time down to, to Egypt. While he was in Egypt, he, uh, he lies to, to Pharaoh. He says to Pharaoh of his wife, and really, she's my sister. Because Abram was afraid, because evidently his wife Sarah was a beautiful woman, and he was afraid that they might kill him to take her. Well, Pharaoh finds out about this lie, and, and Abraham leaves Egypt, but he leaves even better off than when he arrived. Abram has a son with him named Lot. Lot, not, not a son, I'm sorry, it's his nephew. It maybe treated him like a son, but Abram's nephew, Lot, was with him. And they both leave Egypt, but they... They are so blessed by God that the land is not able to support them, not all in one place. And so they separate. And here Lot makes a very tragic decision to pitch his tent towards Sodom, and we have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah to develop from that decision. Abram continues to dwell in the land of Canaan. God appears to Abram, and he makes a covenant with him. And he says to Abraham, as his name will eventually be called, he said, now, I I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you this land, and through you and your seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And the sign of that, of that covenant, was circumcision. Also during this time, even though God had promised Abram, Abraham a son, it had been quite a few years, and I suppose his wife Sarah was thinking there's no way that she could bear a son. She was getting old. And so she gives Abraham her handmaiden, Hagar, and Hagar has a son named Ishmael through the handmaid. Well, God is going to visit with Abraham, and he's going to, again and tell Abraham that, no, you are going to have a son through Sarah, because God had decided it would be through the seed of Abraham and his wife Sarah that these great promises would come about he had made to Abraham. Well, in the meantime, as he is telling Abraham, no, you are going to have a son through Sarah, Abraham is talking with three angels. 
as he's getting this information. And, and God decides that he's going to tell Abraham what he's about to do. He is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. These angels have come to verify that it is as wicked as the report of it has been. And so Abraham is pleading with God through this angel to say, please don't destroy Sodom. And he gets down to, from saying, if you could find 50 righteous people, won't you spare the city? Down to all the way to 10. God, would you spare the city if you can find 10? And God said, yes, I will. But there were not 10 righteous people in all of Sodom. And God, true to his word, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with, with fire from heaven. Lot and his daughters escaped. Lot's wife started out with them to escape, but she turned around and looked back, and God turned her into a pillar of salt. And we have the tragic story of Lot and his daughters, how his daughters actually conceived by their father because they would get him drunk and sleep with him. He didn't even know it because they thought they would, there would be no children for them because of the destruction that had come upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And so that's where we left it before. We talked about the terrible sin of homosexuality that our word sodomy comes from, Sodom and Gomorrah. But now we find, as we pick up our story now, we are in Genesis chapter 20. Again, we always encourage uh, you to get your own Bible and follow along with us, and now to, uh, com to uh, combine that with the study guide. And the, what the study guide does for you, if you have not yet ordered one, there, there's extra information in it that just helps to, to better help us to better understand the text. Abraham now, remember Abraham is, is sort of a wanderer. That's his lifestyle. He goes where the pasture lands are, the grazing land for his livestock. And so Abraham left the oaks of Mamre and he travels further south to the Negev. Now the Negev in some translations is just translated south because that's what the word means. And so he's going further south. In fact, I have a picture here for you of the Negev, and this is a view from uh, Mizpah Raymond of Israel, and Mount Hor is in the distance there, and you can see it's a semi-desert area, even, of course, to this day. And so that's where Abraham now is going as we pick up the story. Now remember when Abraham was going to Egypt, how he lied and said about Sarah, his wife, oh, she's my sister. And really, she was his half-sister. And so now he, he is getting uh, down in the south, and he stops, and he's dwelling at Gerar. And again, he does the same thing. Notice in chapter 20 and verse 2, Now Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Well, he thinks she's a single woman, evidently still an attractive woman, and, and that's an amazing thing. Do, do you remember how old now Sarah is? She's approaching 90 years of age. And still Abimelech sends and takes her. And so he, he uh, includes her into his harem. Now, on the map now you can see that, that he has traveled south to Negev. He's left where he was uh, in Canaan. And he's just gone to the very southern reaches of the promised land, Gerar. And he'll spend uh, quite a bit of time here and in a place called, eventually be called Beersheba. And so uh, God decides to let Abimelech know what's going on here. God does not want anybody else touching Abraham's wife, Sarah. And so he appears to Abimelech in a dream. And he says to Abimelech, um, God doesn't mince words, does he? Look at chapter 20. In verse 3, he says, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. And Abimelech pleads his innocence. Why? I didn't know that she was some man's wife. Did, did they not both say that uh, she's his sister? He's her brother? And, and the innocence and the integrity of my heart, I have done this thing. And, and God says, well, in verse 6, he, he says, um, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, you can read in your study guide some information about possibly what God meant by that. How is it that God did not let him touch her? And not only did he not let him touch her, but it was a, a problem among all of his, his uh, realm there, his household especially. 
that they were not able to have children. Well, this would be something that was very sudden, and it appears that God did not let the, the act occur, not just the conception, but the act, and therefore he did not let Abimelech touch Sarah in that way. And so God says, that's why I didn't allow you to sin against her. So Abimelech, needless to say, he's upset. Just like Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, was upset with Abraham. And now Abimelech says, now what have I done to you? You know, why have you done like this? And Abraham tells him, well, we had this agreement. When, I, when God called me out of the land of my fathers, Ur of the Chaldees, I asked my wife to do this favor for me, that wherever we went, just to say, I'm his sister. Because he knew she was a beautiful, attractive woman, and he was afraid for his life. And so that was their agreement. Doesn't say it was right, but that was their agreement. Abraham was a great man, a great man of faith. But he was not perfect, as none of us are. And so God had, uh, had brought this about on Abimelech's house, and, and now what's, what's to be done? Well, they, they, um, he, he gives a gift, basically, to, to be able to say, Now, see, uh, I've made this right, haven't I? Abimelech uh, uh, says in verse 14, Took sheep, oxen, uh, oxen, male and female servants, and gave them to Abraham, and he restored Sarah, his wife. And, and see, just, he says, You just go and live anywhere you want to in my land. And so that's, that's what they did. And so... Um, we, we find then that um, the story leaves that scene as we end chapter 20. And Abraham does pray to God to, to heal Abimelech, and God does that. He listens to Abraham. Well, remember, before God sent the angels to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he had sent them to tell Abraham this time next year, the cycle of life, Sarah will have a child. Well, notice for, uh, chapter 21 and, and verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. That's a great lesson for us. As you read about God, you find that God does exactly what God says he will do. And if God promises you something, it is as good as done. And here we find that to be the case here. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God has spoken of him. There could be no doubt. It wasn't that somehow Sarah was already uh, pregnant and, and uh, no, it wasn't that. It wasn't that she was some young woman that, that could have happened to just any time. No, it wasn't that at all. God said, here's when it's going to happen. God had promised years earlier, 25 years earlier, that Sarah was going to have a son. But it wasn't that it took 25 years for it to happen. God said nine months earlier it's going to happen. He told him exactly when it would be. But now God's timing is not ours, is it? Remember Sarah had, had um, I guess, gotten discouraged about this and had given her handmaiden Hagar to her own husband to raise a child? To, so that she could conceive, and she did, and she had Ishmael. But that wasn't God's plan. Uh, God's promises were sure. It's just that Sarah wasn't as sure. And so, uh, as we, we look at the story again, we find that, that uh, they named him Isaac. Now, they had a reason to name him Isaac. His name meant laughter. Now, can you think back on our story and think about why the name Laugh, that means laughter would have some special significance. What happened when Sarah heard that she was going to have a child? She laughed. And even Abraham, when he heard it, he laughed. Now, there seemed to be a difference behind their laughter. But still, it, it's, it's a part of the story. And sure enough, they named their son Isaac, which means laughter. And Isaac um, is circumcised on the eighth day as all the male children uh, after, from Abraham on were to be, because that was a sign of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you this land, and through your seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And again, the sign of the covenant was circumcision. Now, Abraham is an, is an old man. Sarah is an old woman. In fact, if, if you have your study guide, look on page uh, 64. 
on page 64. You notice there's a, a little chronology note here, and, and it asks the questions, how old was Abraham when Isaac was born? Well, our story here tells us he's 100 years old. That's old any time, isn't it? But to be having children. Well, how old was Sarah? Well, if you look at the reference given, you go back to that and you see, do the time. Why, she was 90 years old. Well past the age of having children. Well, how long had they been in the land of Canaan? How long had it been since God had said, you're going to have a child, Abraham and Sarah? It had been 25 years. Well, how old was Abraham's first son, Ishmael, that he had through Hagar? How old was Ishmael when Isaac was born? Well, he'd be about 14 years old. And, and these numbers are, have some significance as, as we go. And so you can, you can uh, see that, uh, that, that things are, are unfolding, maybe not at the pace that, in our mind, we might think it should have been, but God's timing is His own. And it happened, though just as God said it would. And so, uh, one day, as time is going on now, uh, Isaac was weaned. And evidently, this was an occasion to have a party, you know, to have a, have a feast. And so, they're, they're having this. They're celebrating. Isaac is, is weaned. You know, it's sort of, sort of a milestone. But Sarah sees Ishmael scoffing at Isaac. I, I don't know why. Here's a teenager. You know how teenagers are. You don't know, know why they do the things they do sometimes. But I tell you what, she didn't like it. And she says to Abraham, Why, well, I don't want him around my son Isaac. He is not going to be an heir along with my son Isaac. And this did not please Abraham at all. After all, Ishmael was his son. She says to Abraham, I want you to send Hagar and her son Ishmael away from here. Well, again, Abraham didn't like it, but God says to Abraham, you listen to your wife, Sarah, because Ishmael is not going to be the one through whom the promises will come. He is not the son of promise. Isaac is. And so you listen to her, and you let her send her away. But it says, now, I, I'm going to be with Ishmael. I'm, I'm going to bless him. He himself will become a great nation. And so... Abraham, I'm sure, with sorrow in his heart, sends Hagar and Ishmael away. Now, I mentioned before, and we're going now to Galatians chapter 4 in our New Testament. I mentioned before that when we come across uh, part of the story that is mentioned elsewhere, like in the New Testament, we'll try to take time to mention that. In, in Galatians 4, there is an allegory made of the story of Sarah and Hagar. Remember, Hagar was the handmaiden. She was the servant. Sarah was the free woman. She was Abraham's wife. And so here, Paul is writing to the Galatians, and he's having a real hard time trying to get them to see that they do not want to be under the old law. Don't go back to the old law. You stay with Christ. In fact, he'd say in chapter 5 and verse 4, if you're trying to be justified by the law, say you have fallen from grace. So he uses the, the example here. And he, he talks about, he starts it um, in uh, verse 22 of Galatians 4. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. The bondwoman, Hagar. The free woman, Sarah. And he says in verse 24, these are symbolic. Symbolic, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. From this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. And so he says, he's, he's saying that, that uh, Ishmael represents born into bondage. And that represents the old law a heavy, burdensome law compared to the law of Christ. And where Isaac is the son of the free woman, representing the spiritualness of the law of Christ, the spiritual nature of it, as opposed to the fleshly nature of the old law. And, and so when we read passages like Galatians chapter 4, and it's talking about Hagar and Sarah, and Isaac and Ishmael, then it helps us to better understand it because we've studied Genesis. And uh, we are better prepared even for Christ. Now, Hagar and Ishmael are sent away. 
Well, they head south to the wilderness of Beersheba. Hagar thinks this is it. I'm out of water. We're just going to die. I can't stand to see my son die. So she puts him under a bush, and she's a little bit distant from him. She can hear him, but... But an angel uh, speaks to, to uh, Hagar and says, No, you're not going to die. God has heard the voice of the lad, and God uh, allows them to find water. They find water, and he says, He's going to be a great nation, Hagar. You're going to make it. It's going to be okay, because God promised that to Abraham. Later, we find Ishmael takes a wife from Egypt, and he becomes an archer in the wilderness of Paran. Now, as you notice on the map here, you'll see that the wilderness of Paran is further south than the Promised Land. Abraham had journeyed to the southernmost uh, outskirts of Canaan. Ishmael is going to be even further south, and, and he'll show up, his descendants will show up in the story as we go through the Old Testament. Now, uh, remember Abimelech. Let's go back to him now in Genesis 21. In verse 22, Abimelech, the king of Gerar, he, he comes to Abraham. He's noticed that, that God is with him, and he wants to make a covenant of peace with Abraham that they won't become enemies at some point because he realizes Abraham would be a formidable enemy, and they make a covenant of peace. Now, uh, Abraham sort of has to take care of some, some other issues that his servants had, had taken over some wells that Abraham had dug. And Abimelech says, hey, I didn't know a thing about that. And Abraham has set aside seven little lambs over here. And, and Abimelech says, what does that mean? He said, well, this is to settle this issue with these wells. I want these to be witnessed that, that these are my wells that your servants have taken over. And so the place was called Beersheba, indicating the seven there. And so... They, they swear a, a covenant of peace with each other there at Beersheba. They have a great feast associated with it. And Abraham is going to remain in that part of the land for some time. Remember, he's a nomad. Uh, he, he travels about a good bit. Now, God tells Abraham something now that is so hard, so hard to even imagine. We're going back now to Genesis chapter 22. You remember it took 25 years <laughs> for, for uh, Isaac to be born. And, and Sarah had, had just given up hope, and, and I don't know if it doesn't say about Abraham, but Sarah is the one that gave her handmaid Hagar to a Abraham, thinking this is just the only way I'm going to have a child to be through another woman. But yet God, true to his word, Isaac is born, there's great rejoicing, and this is the son of promise, and all these blessings, Abraham, are going to come to you and your descendants through Isaac. And now we get to, to Genesis chapter 22, and God says, notice what God says to him. It says, God called to Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Can you just imagine that? I don't know what all Abraham was thinking or feeling, but I know what Abraham did. So, verse 3, Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. There is no indication of any hesitation on the part of Abraham. He obeyed God. He gets there. He and his son Isaac go off by themselves. They leave the servants behind. Isaac is wondering, here's the fire, here's the wood. Where is the offering? And Abraham says, God will provide. He builds the altar up on the mountain. He binds his son Isaac. He has the wood there. He takes his knife. He draws his hand back to, to offer his only son whom he loves. And God says, Abraham. And, and he stops him. It's a, it's a wonderful story, even though it is so difficult for us to understand. He says in verse 12, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. What a test. What a test. And so he, he um, 
he reminds him, or, or reiterates, you might say, the promise that he had made. In verse 16, he says, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Abraham was a great man of faith. But James would tell us in James chapter 2 that faith without works is dead. Abraham would show his faith by doing that whatever it was that God commanded, even offering His Son. Now, let's, let's look in our Bibles to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. I said before that we're not told here what Abraham was thinking, and, and we're not, but we are given an indication elsewhere in Scripture. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to notice verse 17. Several things are said in this great chapter of faith about Abraham and even about Sarah. But it says in verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Does that language sound familiar to you? He offered up his only begotten son, through whom the promises were going to come. Of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. All of Abraham's hope rested in Isaac. And God says, Offer him. Kill him. Offer him as a sacrifice. Well, here's what Abraham was thinking. Notice verse 19. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. See, Abraham uh, especially Sarah, was past the age she should be able to have, have children. Her womb was dead, you might say. And yet here's Isaac. And so Abraham's thinking, God gave him to me from the dead, you might say, and God can give him back to me. Abraham trusted God that even though he didn't understand it, and here God was saying, offer your only son, and, and then, then what, God? God promised it. God said through Isaac, your, all these blessings are going to come. And he believed him. He didn't understand all how God would do it, but he believed that he would. And so he was prepared to do whatever it was that God said. Can't we see the parallels between Abraham offering his only begotten son? Does that not sound like God offering his only begotten son? Jesus. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wonderful parallels. Well, next time, our, I encourage you to be with us. And we're going to, to study uh, in our, our, our study guide as we pick up with some news that Abraham was going to get. Uh, the, the page number, if you're following along, uh, is going to be, let me find it here. Well, oh, page 68. I knew I'd found it earlier. Uh, page 68, news from Nahor's family. And you'll notice in your work guide here that you'll notice the family tree getting larger and larger as, as more and more of the generations are unfolding now uh, as we have traced them from the time Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees. And so we'll see some news come in. We'll sadly see Sarah's death and, and Abraham gets a wife for Isaac and so on. More wonderful stories to come from God's Word. Be with us next time as we continue to seek the old paths.